Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Lambert. Uh, I work at Microsoft. I've been in, I've had the uh, privilege to be in security at Microsoft for 16 years. Uh, I love Blue Hat. Uh, the first Blue Hat at Microsoft was really about connecting security researchers to the engineers. We wanted the engineers building products to really understand uh, the reality of what was possible. And we brought those researchers in to see that. Uh, one thing that I've learned about working with engineers is they hate to be told what to do. They would rather you just tell them what the problem is. And then they can unlock their ingenuity, their insight, and go work on the problem. And this Blue Hat really uh, continues in that tradition, except it's with a great lineup of security researchers and the community. Uh, one thing that I think is special about security is ultimately the security community is is pretty small. And I'm sure many of you have had this experience where if you stay in it long enough, you get to know people in it and they stay in it as well. And I'm sure a number of you here have, work, have met people here that you worked with at other companies or other organizations and you see them again and you take the time to connect. And that's really one of the special things about security. And I do think Israel is special in that regard. A lot of people here know each other from backgrounds in the past and, and continue to connect as they move forward in their career. So as much as Blue Hat is about tools and techniques, it's also about time, the time to connect. Uh, speaking of tools, did you know that Microsoft makes the number one cybersecurity tool? The number one tool. Any idea what it is? Guesses? You look in any security operations center, you will see this tool. Look in any network analyst, you will see them using this Microsoft tool. Get guesses? Excel. Excel, you look in any security operations center, they will all be using Excel. I went to the office division, I said, look, cyber is hot. We should take Excel, we should spin it out, call it Cyber Excel, we would make a billion dollars. They said, John, that's a terrible idea, Excel makes two billion dollars today. <laughs> so, Microsoft is a long way from the company that worked on productivity apps and tools. We are a cloud company. So I thought what I would come here and talk about today is what does cyber mean to Microsoft as a cloud company? Uh, and I'll walk through first and I'll start by taking you through uh, three, the three big trends that I think are really shaping the effect of cyber on Microsoft. The first is what I call the race for the mastery of the cyber domain, which is every country around the world that can is working to master the physics of cyberspace. They're learning about offense, they're learning about defense, they're learning about all of those things. Uh, they know that even if they don't want to start a cyber war, they have to be ready for one, and that means knowing just, as well, just how to attack as well as to defend. Uh, there's this concept called the fifth domain. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, which is the militaries of the world are putting cyber on a peer level with air, land, sea, and space in terms of a sphere they need to operate in. And that really is uh, telling about how entrenched the mindset is about how they need to operationalize cyber. Uh, Snowden, the Snowden documents, it revealed a lot of things. One thing it definitely revealed is just how far behind some countries were in their cyber programs, and there's a lot of cyber catch-up going on right now. Uh, geopolitics are increasingly coloring national f views. We see that with data sovereignty laws popping up all over the world, uh, supply chain concerns, and so on. And in cyber, there's a special dynamic about trickle-down uh, trickle effect from the cyber attack, the cyber technology, cyber weapons that are used in these attacks trickling down to cyber crime. And if, if I were to ask you a few years ago, everybody here remembers Stuxnet, and you'd say, well, would, is Stuxnet something that would affect your neighbor, a family member, a small business? You would say, nope, it was this targeted thing, it was affected over here. But after Stuxnet was revealed and the four Microsoft Zero Days uh, that came out of it were patched, the next quarter, the number one source, the number one reason for attacks against Windows systems worldwide was one of the CVEs used by Stuxnet that had been reappropriated by cybercrime and was used to spread malware around the world. And unlike the other types of weapons in the world, like if you have a Stinger missile, it's not easy for other people to get it. And if somebody does get their hands on it, there are safeguards like special batteries that run down, you have, can't replace them. With cyber stuff, there really is no, you're just a copy away from that going down to cybercrime. And there's other unpredictable things that are happening in cybercrime, like this phenomenon of ransomware. 
there's nothing about the technology that was new, not the encryption, not the delivery mechanism, so forth. It was this invention in the financial world of Bitcoin that really is what permitted ransomware to be rampant today because cyber criminals had a much more effective way to bypass the financial system and to monetize what they're doing. So this is, what, this is the first major trend. The second is um, really the movement to the cloud across all segments. Uh, consumers are having their data moved to the cloud because it's really the effect of miniaturization which can shrink the form factor of any computer to anything you need these days. A watch, a wristband, a smartphone, what have you. If you can dream it up, you can pretty much put that a computer in that form factor. But those computer experiences need to be personalized and they need to be smart. And they're made smart by their connection to the cloud. And so that is putting a lot of consumer data into the cloud. And on the business side, these businesses, whether small business or enterprises, they really want to focus their IT time on their information business problem, not their technology problem. And that's driving them to SaaS, and that's driving a lot of enterprise and business data to the cloud. Uh, and when those customers that for Microsoft might have been on-prem customers five years ago, three years ago, ten years ago, when they become a tenant in your cloud, they bring their adversaries with them to the cloud. And as a cloud provider, we have to be ready for that. The third trend is to meet the demand of these cloud services and SaaS, uh, the largest internet companies in the world are building hyperscale cloud platforms. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, millions of servers in scale, massive compute, dozens and dozens of data centers around the world. If you're not adding you know, hundreds of thousands of servers every single year, if you're not opening up, if you're not working on a dozen data centers right now, you will just never catch up with these hyperscale cloud companies of which Microsoft is one. One dividend that's in there for defenders uh, is a very important one, which is in the drive to build hyperscale cloud to meet the demands of, the, of all these scenarios, the fundamental building blocks, the construction materials of the defense world, uh, defense, defensive systems, compute, storage, and networking, those costs are going down to almost nothing these days. Competition is driving them into the ground. And what do defenders need? They need the ability to query. Well, that's compute. They need the ability to store more data, richer data, retain it for longer. Uh, that's storage. And networking, they need to move that data around uh, and, and process it. And so, you know, if, if I started a cybersecurity startup today, I, want, I would make sure it aligns with the fact that it's going to really piggyback on the fact that the cost for compute storage and networking are going to be fundamentally super cheap in the years to come for all customers because of this, because of the hyperscale. And because of the scale that is possible there we, and the data volumes that can be stored and the compute that can be brought, there are skill sets in cyber that were not present in the security operations teams, the defensive teams of even just five years ago. Now, every response team at Microsoft has a data scientist in it. They have people that do machine learning in it because the ability to do that at the scale that the data is at is actually possible these days. And I think if you, when I look at Google or Facebook or any of these large companies that have excellent security teams, they all have integrated data scientists, machine learning into there. And so there's these new skill sets contributing to this domain of cyber and network security that, uh, that are made possible because of these advances. So some of the takeaways from this one is when, a, when customers become tenants in your cloud, they bring their adversaries with them. And so cloud companies that may have focused on adversaries that would target them now need to be aware of all a much wider range of, of adversaries. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and of course, harnessing these trends to go uh, build solutions. I'll give you some examples of things we're working on at Microsoft that are enabled by uh, these more better defensive physics. And that you can use the cloud to protect itself. You know, people have concerns about moving to the cloud, but there are some unique advantages about it. And by being a cloud service company, we find that we can use the cloud to protect itself, and I'll give you some examples of that to come. So first, tenants bring their adversaries with them. If you had asked us what groups, threat groups at Microsoft we would have been concerned about, say five or seven years ago, we would have listed maybe these four groups, uh, more for sure, but um, we have names that we track these threat groups and they're known to the FireEyes and the CrowdStrikes and so on and so forth, and we would call them Boron and Helium and, 
and fire, I would call them APT3 and 17. And these actors we were focused on because they targeted the tech industry as a whole. And so, of course, they targeted Microsoft as well. And then you've seen Microsoft in recent years start to publish in the security intelligence report, in blogs, things about actors like Strontium, things about actors like Platinum. Now, if you read that, Platinum, targeted attacks in South and Southeast Asia, they are not coming after Microsoft. Why is Microsoft even interested in that threat actor? It's because they're coming after the tenants of our cloud. And because of that, we are now researching all of these threat groups, more than 70 threat groups in total, to understand how these threat groups work, what they oper how they operate, what their infrastructure is, so we can protect our cloud tenants from them. I'll take, uh, I'll take you back in time a little bit and illustrate some of the change in thinking that Microsoft has had and how it's approached this. So you go back a few years ago, uh, there was a group called the Syrian Electronic Army. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. And they uh, were a group of uh, young people that were um, defacing lots of websites and they were aligned with the Assad regime and putting a lot of pro-Syrian messages on them. Uh, they were ha they'd hacked CNN, the Washington Post, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, a long line of companies were, uh, fell to them and had their blogs taken over with messages. And then all of a sudden you see, uh, what's this? Microsoft blogs got defaced a few years ago with this. So before, this might have been something that Microsoft just watched and observed. You know, like, wow, that's a bad thing that happened to them. I wonder if we can help to, oh, oh this just happened to us. Happened to Xbox, happened here, what happened? Um, and so if you go behind the attack, of course, they had a phishing mail, they used simple uh, links. Uh, they lured people to log on pages. This, at the time, was the actual Microsoft login screen that if you were from home and you were trying to access a Microsoft service, you, we had customized the login screen to show our picture. Uh, they used this picture uh, on, in their attack. And they could get this picture, not because they had some sneaky insider knowledge, but because this is the login screen, it's displayed pre-authentication before you log in. So anybody can get these screens for anybody because they're, bef they're before the login has completed. So they use this in their attack. Uh, and they had a way that they went and enumerated users and so on and so forth to target. Uh, and, then they, and then as this attack unfolded, we had our response teams uh, snap into action. They went to the whiteboard. They worked out algorithms to help find this stuff. They came out with, uh, in a way, it was a little bit of whack-a-mole. They'd come in from one IP, uh, fish a user, and then they would start sending mail to fish other users from another IP, so on and so forth. And so uh, one of the response teams developed uh, an algorithm to help find these things uh, out as quickly as possible, which was using sort of a guilt by association um, approach, which is we knew uh, things like the user agent that they would come in on for OWA, for Outlook Web Access, was from a Linux machine. Wasn't a lot of Microsoft use of Linux at the time, so kind of stood out. And so we'd find you coming in from that IP, and we colored those things, and uh, they built an algorithm. They did some data science on it, and then that started to allow us to trivially sort the data. And, and this is being done on a, lar a very large data set, a very large scale, but we were able to do it in real time because of the data scientists that were there. And we could look at these IPs and discover source IPs they're operating from and so on and so forth. Um, now, in the old world of Microsoft, we would have stopped there. We had a problem, we developed a solution, we got on top of it and moved on. But as we had developed this, all these other companies started to be affected as, it by well, as well. And we could see the Syrian Electronic Army starting to target and enumerate them. And we were able to provide that advance warning, what the IPs they were coming from, and so forth, to help these companies as well. So instead of just stopping there, one thing about being a cloud provider is you're also a tenant in your own cloud. We think of Microsoft ourselves as tenant zero in our own cloud services. And so if we have a problem that we think other customers have, we'll solve it in the cloud itself. And then in a way we call this, Satya calls this the first party equal third party principle. In solving the problems that we have, we can also bring those solutions and solve them for other people. And so a couple of years later, Azure Active Directory implemented this geo-anomalous login detection. Um, this, what this algorithm did was, the whole design was to detect people logging in uh, that were not the legitimate user. And it used two important things in how it did that. The first was, 
If you saw Mark Rosinovich's talk yesterday, he talked about the scale of Azure AD, like a billion logins a day, huge volume scale. The first thing this thing looked at is to understand on a per tenant basis, not a one size fits all, on a learned per tenant basis, how likely is it that somebody from that tenant is gonna come from that source IP at all? So when I, I, I normally work in Redmond, obviously those IPs are common. When, we come, when I come here, we have offices in Herzliya, those IPs are common. But when I came to this venue, I had never logged in from that location before. So that's one thing it uses in computing a risk score. How likely is it that you, people from that tenant uh, are coming in from that IP? That's clearly not enough because people go to locations all the time, new locations all the time. Another thing that it uses is it uses GeoIP information to understand what's the likelihood that the person got from point A login to point B IP address login could they have traveled there in a reasonable time? And if you look at this table at the bottom left, it shows uh, Seattle, Washington, a login occurred at a certain time, uh, and then Portland, which is about four hours away. Uh, if you drive like a bat out of hell like Dave Weston, you can get there in uh, maybe three hours. Uh, still possible, but lower likelihood. And then Hartford, Connecticut, which is on the East Coast instead of the West Coast, an hour later, impossible that you could have time traveled, flew, you know, flying a plane or whatnot, and so that gets a much higher risk score. So this is based on machine learning, based on data science, and we applied this to Azure AD, uh, all Azure AD customers, and we started to see real detections in the wild. And the effectiveness of this is, this is, I think, a good illustration of the journey that Microsoft's had from, in the past, we would have solved a problem for ourselves in security response and stopped there. Here we have the cloud scalability to build it for scale for all tenants and then we get the benefit of that because we are a tenant in it. And you can see the ability to do, bring the machine learning data science skill sets to bear, um, help really help us drop it in where we can have the right true positive rate, the right false positive rate and so on and so forth. So let me talk another thing about harnessing some of these economic trends. So for Azure tenants, uh, we see a lot of Azure tenants spin up VMs uh, that they made it, might have used to have on-prem and now they're in the cloud. And that brings new threats to them that maybe they didn't have before. New threats for a couple of reasons. One is a lot of those VMs are directly on the internet. And when you're, if, from going from on-prem behind the corporate firewall to directly on the internet, much different set of threats that we see. The second is uh, the maturity of some people uploading and starting running stuff in Azure. It might be some internal development team that just wants to get infrastructure really quickly and they don't have a mature security operations, secure lockdown mindset. They're just spinning stuff up, putting it up there. And so, uh, so we see attacks against that. I'll walk through a, a few of these here. How many of you have heard of the sticky keys attack? Raise of hands. Okay, I'll tell you what the sticky keys attack is. Sticky keys attack is a way that an attacker can set a single registry key. This assumes they already have admin access to a system. Can set a single registry key, and if they ever lose all their passwords to that system, they can come back and get access again without a resident Trojan, without like a backdoor running, just by setting a single reg key. What it does is it configures uh, this registry key in image file execution options, configures the debugger for this program set hc.exe. That is an accessibility app. And when setHC.exe is invoked, it will run it under the debugger. And this attack configures the debugger instead of being something like WinDebug, NTSD, so on and so forth, Visual Studio, configures it to be the command prompt. The effect of that is if you ever lose, if you do this on a system and you lose access to all the valid credentials to that system, but you can still RDP to the system, now you can get to the logon screen. You can't log in, right, because you don't have any valid credentials. But if you hit shift five times, I don't know if you've ever done this on a Windows, you accidentally hit shift five times, you get this freaking sticky keys thing that pops up. Well, instead of sticky keys popping up, you get a command prompt as local system on the login desktop. That is the brilliance of sticky keys. So uh, sticky keys, so the question is, are people doing that against Azure tenants? Is it happening? So uh, we work with, uh, the Azure uh, Security Center team. We built the Texans and sure enough, um, we see cases where Azure tenants uh, are having the sticky keys attack perform on them. And then is anybody actually term serving and invoking that attack? In this subscription, 
uh, where we were doing this investigation. Indeed, we saw somebody come in and do the sticky keys attack to get into the system. What did they do after they logged in? Well, one thing we could tell is we could tell where did they term serve in from? What was the source IP of that? And then we got this IP that was term serving to that subscription, legitimate customer, but from Iran. So probably not some, probably not some real thing. And this here is what I'm going to illustrate on this slide and the next one is what we call the formulas of detection. So one of the formulas of detections is at the top there. Detections times hits equals threat intel plus one. And what that means is if you review all the hits on your detections, you're going to gain something in your threat intel side. So here, this IP address that we know is associated with some hostile actor, that we just added to our threat intel just by reviewing detection hits. And then another formula, I'll show you the next slide, is if you review your detection hits, you're going to get detections plus one. You're going to come up with some new aspect of the attack that you didn't detect before that you can build detections for. Um, so what did this attacker do when they logged in? They got real busy and did a whole bunch of stuff. Let me show you a few things. First thing they do is run this, their, this malware, wrdsd.exe, which is like their malware installer tool. Uh, the very next thing they do is, if you've ever term served to a machine and they have this, like, and, and the machine has, hey, you, this uh, pop-up comes up, you can only log into this, so authorized use only, so on and so forth. That's stored in the legal notice caption registry key. So they just delete that. That annoys them uh, to see that. The next thing they do is create a bunch of backdoor admin accounts. You can see the variety there, this VMware converter essay, they chose that one. Um, they uh, also added a fake ASP.NET account in there. Uh, and then they, they're going to repurpose the machine to do what they want it to do. If, you, if I were to summarize the kind of attacks we see in terms of what are the actions on intent that attackers have when they compromise an Azure VM, it's sending spam, Bitcoin mining, RDP brute forcing other machines on the internet, uh, scanning for other vulnerable machines, uh, streaming video, probably not video safe to show here. Um, so this one, this guy's sending spam. Uh, and then he's also downloaded, it's, he installed Chrome, friggin' A, installed Chrome. Um, and he downloaded this dubrute.exe tool, which is an RDP brute forcing tool, and then he's configuring the logins and so on and so forth for it. So this is here. So we saw him running this malware tool. So we didn't have a detection for that malware tool, right? We just learned about it with this incident. Do we see this being run in anywhere else? Uh, and when we did that investigation, we could see many other subscriptions that where th this attacker had been successful. And so that's that's led us to this approach where when a detection fires and we do an investigation, we can look at the host level, the network level, do some forensics. Maybe a crash happened in there. We can use our crash analytics to find it and then come up with new detections. And because there's log data there that the cloud allows you to store rich log data, you can walk backwards to find out how did they get in. If you didn't figure out how they got in, uh, when you find one of these attacks, I kind of think of it as you found a leg bone, there's probably an arm bone there. Go find that and you can put together the skeleton of the attack. And then you can also go forward to see what their actions on intent and whatnot there. So I, I call this the, the Fibonacci model, which is if you want to build the detections arsenal, I think this is the fastest way to build it, which is essentially exploiting the pivoting that is possible to the closure of the pivoting. So you have a detection, it finds something. You go look at that detection and you learn about some new technique to fingerprint. You fingerprint that. Now you find a bunch more places where that's going on. There's probably different attacks, at different attackers going on in there. You're going to learn yet more things to go on in there. Continue to pivot until the closure of that and it's a very fast way to build the detection arsenal. So I call that the Fibonacci model because like one detection leads to one thing which leads to two which leads to so on and so forth. Um, and so at Microsoft uh, we have a threat intelligence system. We take um, a lot of the lines of business that we're in give us aperture, give us visibility into threats. You can see down here, Office 365, Windows Defender ATP, so on and so forth. Uh, and our threat intelligence system is really fueled by the great visibility, aperture, capabilities that we have, as well as uh, an amazing set of analysts that the company has across Windows uh, Cloud and Enterprise Division and Office that do understand the threats, investigate them, so on and so forth. So 
the last section here I want to talk about is how we can use the cloud to protect itself. So um, if I were to talk to you about security products, and I'm not going to talk to you about the security products here, you know, you'd hear about Office 365, you'd hear about Windows Defender, but it, actually if you look at them another way, they really map very well to the kill chain. And you could think of these products, ATA, uh, looking at user authentications with Active Directory, all of these things actually give you detection and control points all along the kill chain, both on-prem and in the cloud. And by making them work together, you can piece together the attack against them. And I would say two years, ag two years ago from Microsoft, we had basically none of these things. Now we have all of these things, and we're working on improving them in every single phase and having them work better together. And I'll give you an example here between um, Office and Windows, Windows Endpoint, because when you have products in multiple phases of the kill chain, you get a discount. And what I mean by a discount is, if you find something, some threat that happens in email, that threat is aimed at an endpoint. And if you catch it in email, you're, all, you're gonna learn what that thing is gonna look like on an endpoint, and you can build a detection for it there. But you didn't have to find it there, you got a discount to finding it there. So by working multiple phases of the kill chain, you get a 30, 40, whatever percent discount by participating in it across. So one of the technologies uh, that my team works on is, is called detonation. Uh, sandbox uh, is a more common way. Why do we detonate things? We detonate, um, for customers that, that pay for it, we detonate all of their email attachments. Uh, they go into a virtual machine. If you ever get an email attachment, Word document, you wonder, is this thing safe to open? We, with this uh, detonation, we open them in a VM so you don't have to. Um, and the reason detonation is important is because, of course, for antivirus signatures, these are examples of, of macros in Word and Excel that are malicious, and of course they ran the gamut and they changed themselves up uh, tremendously, uh, and making it very difficult to signature these things in a proactive way. But we can run them in a VM and see what their behaviors are. So when we do that, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I'd say, attacker innovation going on in the world of attachments and document lures. And if you haven't seen it, some of the lures that they're convincing users to enable macros are very convincing. This is one that uses um, a UK HM revenue and customs form, and they have a dialogue that says, you know, trying to trick the user to uh, enable, click the enable content button. This is one is another one that's purporting to be like a PGP uh, style message. Um, this one, there's a lot of these documents that essentially have, we call them the fuzzy document lures. They blur something out like this, and they say, well, to see it, you need to click the enable content button. Uh, probably not the best wording we could have used on that button, but um, that's, um, th and then this is, you know, so on and so forth. They have a lot of these kind of lures. Uh, this one is, there was a whole set of them that used a subpoena theme in New Zealand, the U.S., the U.K. I mean, if you got an email document that said it was a subpoena and you were probably not a computer expert like uh, yourself, you might uh, raise your blood pressure and click on this thing. The next thing that we see a lot of these uh, attackers doing in detonation is they want to evade detection as much as possible and even evade detonation, evade sandboxes. Microsoft's not the only company processing emails in sandboxes. FireEye Solution, Proofpoint, others. Uh, and so the next thing they've done is they move to encrypting their attachments. And in the email body, they tell, convey what the password is to the user. Uh, and the encryption that we have in Office documents these days is actually really strong in the sense that um, if we tried to just brute force, let's say we said, okay, these documents probably have a pin, five or six, four, five, six digit pin, let's just brute force them all. With zip files, you can crack the pin space for a zip file or a RAR file in no time flat. You can just brute force it. But for modern Office documents, it takes about a second per attempt. And now you really got to start to think, you're going to delay every encrypted mail by however many seconds that is probably not that feasible. So you really need to be able to get the full email body, be smart about picking out what the candidate passwords are, and so on. But encrypting is one thing they're doing to bypass content scanning, sandboxes, uh, and detonation. Then, before they drop their payload, uh, they do a lot of vetting. This is the kind of techniques, techniques that we saw more sophisticated actors do that have now trickled down to cybercrime. So many of the macros that we see in malicious word attachments, before they download or drop the payload, 
One of the things they do here, you can see at the top, is they're checking the username, and they're going to make sure it's not one of the well-known sandbox usernames like admin or malware or whatnot. They have a, a list of those things. They also want to make sure that the client machine they're running on is seems like a real client machine, a real endpoint. It checks the uh, recent files count in Word. If you haven't opened like at least three documents, it's not a real end user machine. It's probably a sandbox. And then they, if you haven't, then they, they exit right there. And this last one at the bottom, it's a little bit obfuscated, but one of the things they did was uh, there's this feature in Windows called the Mark of the Web. And the way it works is when you save an attachment, download something from the internet, in an alternate data stream associated with that file says it came from the internet. And then uh, the UI and other programs can display more warnings because they know where that file, it was not just a local file and they can give differentiated security. So these, this strain thought, you know when files are detonated? I doubt the detonation is like opening Outlook, dragging it out, you know, putting this mark of the web. I bet you they just run the file as in there. And indeed, many sandboxes had that problem. That, that was their sandbox bypass. They looked to see if the mark of the web was present on disk. Um, another two techniques here, one is uh, GOIP evasion. So they, when they run, one of the first things they do is they call out to a GOIP service on the internet. Um, this one uh, here is um, going to MaxMind. We've seen a number of other ones. And this was a totally different uh, word macro threat that Query WTF is, is my IP. And then that will return to them what ISP, what network they think they're in. Because nowadays, many of the email campaigns that we see are targeted for specific regions. And so they're, they're targeted for the Netherlands, Australia, where have you. And they make sure that they're being opened in those countries in a, in a little IP that geos to that country. And if not, they don't do anything. And it's a way they try to preserve their stealth. And then um, the next example here is uh, other vetting that they do on the network. So they get the, I they get the information associated with the IP address, and then they have a blacklist of keywords. And if, the, if it has Microsoft in it, FireEye in it, uh, Cloud, whatever, they figure that's not, a, that's not a real enterprise or victim network that I want to be in, and they do nothing. And they just continue to add to this list of keywords. So. Part of the reason that we detonate stuff is the traditional model of finding malware campaigns at scale. Uh, most, uh, uh, the way that the attacks work uh, that we see in Office 365 is malware campaigns usually run Sunday to Thursday. There's really no major malware campaigns on the weekend because people aren't reading their mail on the weekend and they don't want it to sit there and have a chance for it to all get signatured uh, before the users open it. So Sunday night is busy time and they go all the way to Thursday and then they'll send, you know, they'll test against antivirus and then they'll send a million mails at a time in these different waves uh, to get it. And so if you, from a traditional AV response point of view, if you didn't know about it ahead of time, by the time you know about it, you get it into the hands of an analyst, he writes a signature for it, you queue it up, QA test it, deploy it, that campaign is over. They already sent a million mails in four hours. So, um, and so detonation is designed to get ahead of that because w as soon as the, they come in, uh, we can start to detonate them either because the tenant is paying for this ATP service or even if tenants are not paying for it, once we see a slight uptick, we automatically queue that type of attachment for detonation. And as soon as the detonation result comes back, we start blocking it for all tenants. And so there is a beneficial effect where the customers that where we're getting the ATP verdicts for are actually being applied to all customers of Office 365 and they're getting a security dividend for that. And then every, everything that detonation finds is a false negative for the AV team and they work very rapidly to close that loop as well and protect uh, all endpoints regardless of whether an Office customer or not. So detonation, we, when we do it, we look we have a, a stat, we have like kind of a multi-phase uh, thing that we do. First, we look at the file statically. That'll tell us things like, is it encrypted or not? A lot of malware will do things like just spoof the icon. They'll use the icon for Word or Explore or some other Adobe, some app, and they're clearly not those apps. That's an easy thing to do. You don't even have to run it, but you can see these spoofed icons. Um, the next thing is to get, we have deep instrumentation into the application layer itself. 
And we need that because they're doing all of this sandbox evasion. They're checking recent files. They're doing this environment vetting at the application level, in JavaScript, in the macro, so on and so forth. And if you don't have instrumentation at that level, you're not really going to see any interesting operating system uh, level interactions. And then, of course, we, s we log all the operating system interactions um, and see what it does. Um, and then log all the network activity it does and have analytics across all four layers here. So um, I hope you got a sense of uh, what we've, Microsoft's journey from being an on-prem uh, box product software company to a cloud company and how the world of cyber is starting to touch that. Uh, we have threat analysts that are working to study the adversaries of our tenants and build detections and protections for those across the range of things that you saw earlier. Uh, and, and for customers that are not used to the new threats they're going to face in the cloud, making sure that we have provided stuff that is going to help them so they're ready from the get-go. Uh, and then taking advantage of the new skill sets that can, uh, be, we can use them on the much richer data, like we can capture more data, much richer for longer from a huger swath of the network, of the environment, and then apply these uh, more complex analytical methods to it. Mark talked a lot about machine learning. Uh, we have a lot in log analytics as well, uh, and get some answers out of that. And then last is we can use the cloud to protect itself. And one of the other examples that Mark uh, referenced yesterday I thought was really instructive here, which was, if you remember, he gave a machine learning example where to detect whether an Azure machine is compromised, you can tell that if it's likely sending spam, because that's one of the actions on intent I mentioned they did earlier. How do you know it's sending spam? You look at its network traffic and you apply machine learning and you know that's more like the spam traffic. How do we, how do we figure out how to label that for machine learning? We took the output of Office 365 because it has a great set of spam labels, and then we can take that and apply that to the network traffic we see out of Azure VMs. And it was really an interesting example, I thought, of how being in two cloud businesses give you a unique detection opportunity. And it's, it's almost like just by a company like Toys R Us or Walmart using Office, we can protect a totally different customer, a defense contractor using Azure, just because of how we can apply the learning across the two of them. So that's what I wanted to come here and present today. Uh, thank you all for your attendance. Any questions you have, just catch me on the side. I'd be happy to talk to all of you. Thank you.